without him. But if you have your Bibles, we plan on preaching from it. And if you have it, we're going to preach from it. I'm going to keep it simple this morning, but I'm going to hold you and I hold you too long, but I'm going to hold you long enough. If you would rise to your feet, we're coming from the book of First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. And Scott, if you did not look like a ninja, I wouldn't have known better. <laughs> I know that he's got a little samurai sword. He's ready to jump up out of there. That's our AV. He's our man with the plan. We're coming from 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, the 16th through the 18th verses. Three short verses, but they have a lot of power to them. If you have a say, amen. If you need more time to say, hold on, Pastor. All right, we'll wait. It's not so hard. It's um, it's 1 Thessalonians. It comes before 2 Thessalonians. And after Colossians, it's a nice chapter. Thessalonica is a city in Greece that um, Paul visited and established a church there and found the believers to be generous, loving, kind, and obedient. That wasn't easy for Paul always. Well, I'll talk about that later on in the sermon. Has everybody have it? Say amen. Amen. And it reads as follows. Verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I'm going to read it one more time because it is so short. Verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Please be seated while I pray. Father God, I just thank you for this day, Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we are thankful for the opportunity to come before your throne of grace. So just thank you for every blessing. The blessing of health, the blessing of life, the blessing of strength, Lord. The blessing to have a place to worship you and praise you, Father God. Lord, we just thank you right now for everything that you are doing in our lives, Lord. Lord, we are just thankful for the good and the bad. And Father God, right now, be with those who are suffering, those who are in pain, those who need peace, those who have chaos reigning in their life. Be the peace that they need, Father God. Be the love that they need, Father God. Be that joy that they need, Father God. Right now, there's only one place that we can get joy, and that's in Jesus. And the only one that can bring peace is in your son, Jesus. And it is in his name, Lord, that we call those who are lost to come to the cross today at the end of the service, Lord, that one will cry out, I yield, I yield, that I want to be saved. I want to be made whole. We thank you now, Lord, in advance for the increase. But Father God, reduce me, Lord. Humble me, your servant, Lord. As you gave me this sermon in private, now I make it public to all, Lord. Father God, allow someone to hear it and give their lives to Christ. Let the congregation see you, Lord, and hear only you and not see me. But it is in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and the church said amen. Amen. Give an honor to God, to the saints in Christ seated here before me. Once again, it is a privilege to, to speak to you and see you this morning and discuss the following. I would like to lift up these three words from each verse. Since they're short verses, I would like to lift up these three words from each verse. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. I like to speak from the thought this morning, just do it. Just do it. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, what size sneaker do you wear? A few years back, Nike had an advertising campaign titled, Just Do It. This theme was centered around the idea that no matter what the circumstance, whether you are sleepy, tired, not feeling well, you would, no matter what the situation, the weather conditions, rain, sleet, or snow, the person wearing Nikes was expected to run jump, play basketball, play football, play soccer, play baseball, whatever the sport during any time of day, they were to just do it. And that's what you see here today in these verses, these three short verses. Paul is writing to Thessalonians to encourage them because of persecution they were facing for being a Christian. 
And let me say this about Paul. When Paul wrote more than one letter to you, it was because either you were in trouble for your conduct, like 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, or you were doing something really well, and he's commending you for your good conduct and in continued encouragement. Example, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Paul throughout the book of Thessalonians in chapter 1 was filled with words of encouragement. And in chapter 2 and 3, Paul would exhort them concerning their keeping their faith because he was afraid that they would start to lose their faith due to persecution. It is in chapter 4, Paul warned them about sexual misconduct and told them to remain pure and not to deceive one another for personal gain and warning them to be continuously holy in their conduct and holy before the world and in just conduct towards one another. Later on in chapter 4, Paul explained our exit plan. It's called the rapture, if you didn't know. Paul told them and us not to be ignorant about the Lord's return. He said that at the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise, and those who are alive will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Lastly, in chapter 5, Paul is exhorting believers, reminding them to remain sober and awoke, echoing the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus, the same words that Jesus spoke to his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. But it is here in chapter 5, he tells us to edify one another. The word edify means to build up and encourage. And that's what I plan to do today, brothers and sisters. Let us draw closer to the word of God. Looking at verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Here's where I'd like to give you three for the Trinity. We see my first point. Even when we don't want to, we must rejoice continually. I'm going to repeat it again. Even when we don't want to, we must rejoice continually. Paul tells us, and Paul knows that all the churches he planted, all over Greece, all over Asia Minor, were going to suffer some persecution. We're going to go through some hardships. But let's be honest, brothers and sisters, we are suffering persecution today. If you can't pray openly without people criticizing you, or if you tell people that they are living a lifestyle that is contrary to the Bible, they call you paranoid, they call you old-fashioned, they might even call you a bigot brothers and sisters Christians today are being ostracized criticized and marginalized for our beliefs in Jesus Christ Paul warned Timothy a young pastor saying to him in 2nd Timothy 3 and 12 yes all who suffer and desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution yet even though we suffer persecution Paul wants us to do one thing rejoice continuously he says rejoice evermore tell your neighbor rejoice we as believers know that our true happiness is not predicated on someone or something let me give you an example y'all know how I spare no expense when it comes to taking my lovely wife out for, for, for a meal we pull up to the drive through window for an expensive meal at McDonald's I ordered a happy meal the nugget chicken nuggets fries and a coke I eat the meal and let her have the toy I'm happy she's not you see, if Sister Stewart depended on me to make her happy, she'd be very disappointed. That's why I take her to Salem's after church. You see, Paul is telling you and me, my brothers and sisters, that our true joy comes from God. Not from man, not from things, but from God. Jesus will never disappoint you. Jesus will never let you down. Jesus will always help you. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. All our strength and joy comes from him. Let me put some Bible to that. Nehemiah chapter 8 and 10 says, For the joy of the Lord is our strength. You see, true joy comes from the inside, not from the outside. It is the power of the Holy Spirit inside each and every one of us, Jan. You see, people will always disappoint you. Your wife may leave you. Your husband may leave you. Your friends may forsake you. Your bosses may fire you. But Jesus will always love you. That should have caused someone to shout hallelujah right there. Jesus said he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you know that he will give you a peace that passes all understanding? 
Jesus told us, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, Marty. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, Crystal. Neither let it be afraid. Tell your neighbor again, rejoice. Look at the text. The word evermore means forever, eternal, always, without stopping, without ceasing. In other words, just do it. We must always rejoice. And here's the thing. We must rejoice in all circumstances, in all situations, at all times, and in all places. Why? Because praise is what we do, Pat. We are, we are, we were, are created to give God glory. How do I know this? Psalm 100 tells us the following. We are to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve him with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We are created to give God glory and give him praise. We are to rejoice no matter what the circumstances are in our lives. Now, I know you're saying, Pastor Stewart, you got a Pollyanna attitude. No, not really. I'm just going by the scripture. I know people are suffering. I know people are hurting bad. I know people are afraid and fear is running rampant, filling our minds with horrible thoughts. People are scared, filled with fear because they lost their jobs. Their health has gone bad. They're afraid of the COVID. They have the COVID. Their mortgage is due. Their rent is past due. Everything is overdue and you feel like, you feel, feel like you're swimming in some doo-doo. And I know you feel like I just don't know what to do. But I've got to send my kids to school. I'm supposed to do. What am I supposed to do? I'm so scared. B, rejoice. Nancy, rejoice. Give God praise in everything, for everything, because of everything. Because if you need a reason to rejoice, let me give you a few to think about. Psalms 33 and 1 says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Psalm 63 and 3 says, Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Let them rejoice exceedingly. Chronicles 16, 10 says, Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Psalm 33 and 21 says, for our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Psalm 70 and 4 says, may all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Psalm 4 and uh, as you were Philippians 4 and 4 says, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. We have all the reason to praise. And if you don't have a reason to praise, praise God for the following. He woke you up this morning. That's one reason. Praise God because you can see me and I can see you. You have clothes on your back. You dress yourself this morning. You have a roof over your head. You got food in your fridge. You got reasonable health and strength. You may have a few nickels and pennies in your pocket, but praise is what we do. We must rejoice. So God, in, rejoice in God in good times. Rejoice in God in bad times. Praise him in all the time. And again, I I say rejoice turn to your neighbor and tell them just do it don't you know don't you know that praise confuses the enemy praise confuses the enemy Lorraine you remember Jehoshaphat he sent his praise and worship team into battle first to give God glory and it caused the enemy to kill themselves and kill themselves and wipe themselves totally out they didn't even have to raise a hand to fight the enemy because God's praise to him wiped out the enemy and confused him praise confused him so rejoice again I say rejoice anybody here knows how to say the word hallelujah say hallelujah tell your neighbor just do it come on and give God a hand clap of praise look at verse 17 verse 17 says pray without ceasing we see our second point all the time every time we must pray continuously all the time every time we must pray continuously just keep your eyes on the text B, the central theme here about prayer is this. In the Christian life, the act of prayer should not be intermittent, 
sometimes, once in a while, occasionally, and whenever you think you might feel like it, prayer shouldn't be like that. But the spirit of action, the spirit of prayer must be incessant, meaning without ceasing. Prayer is our way of communicating with our Heavenly Father. There's an old song that used to go, and I won't sing it, Sister Stewart. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer wheel turning, you'll know the fire is burning. Just have a little talk with Jesus, and Jesus will make it all right. And then you go into the part that says, all right, and all right, Jesus will make it all right. That's one of my favorite songs because that's what we got to do. We got to pray to the Lord. It's about a relationship, y'all. The believer can call on Jesus 24-7, 365 days, 52 weeks, and 12 months for a whole year. And this is a guarantee from God. You will never get Jesus' answer in service. He will never put you on hold. He will never tell you, leave a message at the beep. God hears the prayers of the righteous. He hears the prayers of his children because he has a relationship with him. We can call on Jesus because he promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. I know I've said it before, but I'm saying it again because people doubt, people don't want to believe, and people don't want to trust in the promises of God. But if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, he's not obligated to hear your cry. He's not obligated to answer your call. And if Jesus had an answering service, you might get a message like this. Mailbox is full. You must be. You got to be born again. Jesus is the only way and he only knows his children. And he calls each and every one of his children by name. John 10, 3 says, To him the doorkeeper opens and his sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. He calls you Marty. He calls you Pat. He calls you Lorraine. He calls you Richard. He calls you Mary. He calls you Scott. He calls you Sasha. He calls you Minerva. He calls you Alex. He calls you Sean. He calls you by name. And here's the best part. We don't get lost because he leads us. The Bible says, who shall ever call on the name of the Lord shall be, will be saved. Now you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. But when you do that, your prayers are heard because you just joined the family of God and have full membership and privileges as a child of the one true king. Nancy, let me explain. When you go to Sam's Club and Costco's, you have to be a member. You're required to, if you, you can't make any purchases unless you're a member. Oh, they'll let you walk in, walk around, look and everything, but won't let you buy anything unless you're a member. Well, it's the same thing with Jesus. You can read the Bible, talk like Christians. You say words like amen and hallelujah and God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. You can hang out with Christians. You can even lack, act like a Christian, pretending to be holy, saved, and sanctified. But when you die and it's time to go to heaven, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're not getting in the door. You can't make any purchases. But here's the best part about being a Christian. Here's the best part. We don't even have to pay our membership fee. 1 Peter 1 and 18 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus. I'm going to say that part again. With the precious blood of Jesus as a spot of a lamb without blemish or stain. Jesus paid it all on the cross. Now we have access to the Father through his Son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So by his purchase of our membership in the heaven, by his precious blood. Tell your neighbor, I'm praying for you. The text says, pray without ceasing. Prayer. Prayer. I don't know how much I can stress this, how important prayer is. Throughout the Bible, there are many great examples of prayer. Nehemiah prayed for the restoration of Israel and for forgiveness. Daniel prayed to God and sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. Paul and Silas sang songs and prayed while in prison. So powerful was their prayer that God sent an earthquake to destroy the prison. 
You see, prayer is our direct communication. It is our link to the hotline to God. There are some events in our lives that will just drive you to your knees. Just look at the example of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed so hard, the Gospel of Luke tells us, that his sweat came down like pillars of blood. Paul, Paul tells the believer, don't stop, never quit, never surrender. Just keep doing it, keep praying, pray without ceasing, just keep going. Here's the thing about prayer, Minerva. Prayer must be important because it is mentioned over 306 times in the Bible in one form or another. When a friend calls you, they may put you on hold. When you call a business, they may play the music while you're on hold. Your enemies may even hang up on you, but Jesus, my Savior, says, I will hear your call. I answer your prayers. You remember when cell phones first came out? You make a call and it was all fuzzy. You start talking and you could say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You would move around, going from place to place, trying to get good communication, trying to get a good connection. Or even worse, you would drop the call or it was totally disconnected. Has it ever happened to anyone besides me? The truth be known, it still happens today. But I'm here to tell you, Sprint can't move any faster to answer your prayer. AT&T can't even spell because they forgot the other 24 letters. T-Mobile is stuck in a rut and not moving. Verizon is somewhere over the horizon. Even Boost needs a lift. But when you got bills due, you got more month than money, your spouse ain't acting right, your kids ain't acting right, you get a call from the doctor telling you some bad news, and the only thing the prayer that you have is, Father, I stretch my hand to thee, no other help I know. He may not come when you call him, but he always rise on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Somebody shout hallelujah. I need two people to shout hallelujah. Jesus does not drop our calls like our cell phone companies do. He hears our cries. He pities our every moment, and he answers our prayers. Prayer, prayer is a constant thing we've got to do. It doesn't have to be fancy. It don't have to be filled with complicated big words. The simplest prayer is just this, this, maybe. You might be just moaning in your heart, but the Holy Spirit hears it when you're going, because mm -hmm, you don't know what to say, but the Holy Spirit knows everything in the moaning of your heart. Let your heart cry out honestly to the Father. Let it cry out to Jesus, and he hears your cry. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise right now. Come on, let him know that you're thankful for the blessings of this day. My first point to review, when you don't want to, we must rejoice. We got to. Now, I don't care what the situation is, we got to be thankful. Secondly, all the time we must pray continuously. Lastly, my third point, whatever is going on in our lives, we must always give thanks continually. Verse 18. This is hard because when you read this verse, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's my favorite part right there, concerning you because we're in the will of God. But here's the best part, in everything. This is hard, y'all. Think about Joseph. He's in that hole. His brothers just put him there that night. And he had to sit there that whole night till the Ishmaelites come. But when they pull him out of the hole, they don't tell him that he's being sold. He don't know that. First they rough him up, drop him, and then they pull him up and then sell him. And that whole long walk to Egypt, he's thinking about, they just portrayed me. How can that be good? Then he goes in part of his house. He sits there working as a slave and then gets lied on by that woman and gets thrown in prison. How can that be good? And then Pharaoh has some dreams, and the only one that can interpret them is him. You don't see God working the good in your life, but all things work for good for those who are called according to his purpose in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 to 8 says that. So when your life is falling apart, in all circumstances, give them thanks. When you just got fired, you give them thanks. When your wife or husband left you, you probably said, thank you, Lord, but give them thanks. It doesn't matter the circumstances, just do it. Give thanks. Please don't miss the last part of that verse, because it says, it is the will of God in Christ Jesus. 
You see, just like rejoicing or joy, it's not what's on the outside of you that makes you give thanks, but it's the God in me that makes me give thanks. Because when you look back over your life and think about what God has done for you, where he brought you out of, kept you out from, kept you out of prison, kept you out of jail, kept you out of drugs, has delivered you from whatever it was that you got into, the Lord, your Savior, got you out of it. I worship him because of who he is and what he's done for me. Anybody here can say that with me? We are here to give God thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, I don't know what you're going through in your life. Only you and God know. But here it is, my brothers and sisters. You're in God's hands in his loving will. Look at the scripture. It says there's no better place to be. Again, give God thanks for it is the will of God. In who? In Christ Jesus. Somebody say a sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Why? Why? It is concerning the why owing you. Look what it says. It is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning why owe you. No one else claims to do that for you. Buddha can't do it. Muhammad can't do it. I don't care who you go to, but right now it's only in Jesus because it's in the perfect will of God concerning you. He's the only one that loves and cares for you. So we are locked in. We are secure. We are sealed. We are sheltered. We are protected. All in God's perfect will. In Christ Jesus. Somebody should have shouted hallelujah right there. Paul was thankful. Paul was content. He had been shipwrecked many times. He learned to go without some luxuries from time to time. He learned how to be content in whatever state he was in. Everywhere and in all things. Paul had learned to be full and how to be hungry. He learned how to have enough and suffer need. Paul learned that he can do all things through Christ Jesus. That strengthens me. He knew how to give God praise. But Jesus gave us the example of living, when he, of giving thanks daily. When he broke the bread to give and feed 5,000, he gave thanks. When he broke the bread at the Last Supper, he gave thanks. When he was eating fish with his disciples after his resurrection, he gave thanks. You see, rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks is what we are supposed to do. If Randy was here, I would say to Randy, you know the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? And Randy probably say, go ahead and tell us, and I will. You see, a thermometer measures the temperature of the outside air. If it's 90 degrees or if it's negative 32 below zero, it just measures it, and you can't change it. But if Margie was here, I would tell her a thermostat changes the temperature in the house. If it's too cold, you can heat it up. And if it's too hot, you can cool the house down. You see, a thermostat changes the temperature around you. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. We have to change the world around us. How we do it? I'm glad you asked that question. By rejoicing, by praying, and giving thanks. Doing these things makes the things around you change. We have to be the thermostat that the people see. Or in other words, we have to be the Jesus that people see. We set the temperature. We must set the example. We must make the change. Change the environment. Change the attitudes. Change the world around us. How do we do that, B? I'm glad you asked that question. By rejoicing. Rejoicing, giving God praise, giving God glory, worship him in the beauty of his holiness. People will see you praising and worshiping and they will want to praise God. Make where you stand holy ground. Giving God glory. Make where you're standing a sanctuary of worship and praise. Let the whole world know that you know God and love him and he's yours. For God I live and for God I die, Scott. We must pray without ceasing. Rachel, don't stop. Get it, get it. Put your praise in it. For prayer, prayer, safety of your family, your brothers. Pray for the safety of your sisters in Christ. Pray for your mean old boss. Pray for your job. Pray for our world. Pray for our nation. Pray for our state. Pray for our county. Pray for our city. Pray for those lost souls who don't know Jesus. Pray for their salvation. Just pray. And when you're done praising, praying, give God some glory. Give God some thanks. We have so much to be thankful for. Thank him for your health. Thank him for your church. Thank him for your neighbor. Thank him for his son, Jesus. Thank him for that $2.37 you have in your pocket. We have to be like Job. When he lost everything, he stopped, praised, prayed, and gave 
things all the time. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Be like David who said, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise will be continually be in my mouth. The Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Change is to rejoice. Change is to praise. Change is to give thanks in all things, in the bad and the good. Never stopping, always, but being thankful. Because when you look back over the things and think about what God has done for you, what he has kept you out of, how he has delivered you, I worship him because of who he is. Can anybody here say that today? You praise him for the cross. You gave thanks for the three days. You give thanks for the resurrection. His blood that covers and saves you. Again, I say rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Just do it. To God be the glory.